Hi everyone, uh, thank you very much for coming today. Uh, for those of you who don't know, my name's Ainsley, I'm one of the curators at CCA. Um, I'm using this microphone not um, for amplification, but just for the recording, which is kind of weird. But um, when we, we have audience questions at the end, I'll just make, pass this uh, microphone out. If, and if you want to ask a question, please just try, try to use this, because we want to get a nice recording. Um, so this event today um, is part of uh, the Tilton Axis Fellowship. Um, uh, that has been happening for the last month uh, and in, in collaboration with the Race, Rights and Sovereignty series at uh, Glasgow School of Art. Um, so the Tilton Axis Fellowship, um, it's, I'll just tell you a little bit about it. Um, it's the direct outcome of some meetings that took place at Fresh Milk in Barbados in 2016 and um, sorry, in 2015 and then again in 2016 at the Perez Art Museum in Miami. Um, and it follows on from the inaugural fellowship in 2017 that was awarded to Jamaican curator Nicole Smith Johnson, who was here um, in 2017. And so for this iteration, uh, we've come together with some slightly different partners, some, some the same. Uh, so Glasgow School of Art, the, um, the School of Art History Department, uh, sorry, the School of Art, uh, Art History at University of St Andrews, CCA Glasgow, Lux Scotland, Hospital Field, the British Council and Curatorial Dual Mother Tongue. Um, and together these partners have been offering the, uh, offered this fellowship um, in Scotland for an emerging contemporary art practitioner living and working in the Caribbean. Um, and the idea was to share knowledge around current approaches towards commissioning and working in the arts. And the fellowship focuses on the development of pragmatic and critical curatorial and artistic practice hailing from the Caribbean region and is research and practice led and mentor based. And lysandro has been here with us in, in Glasgow for the last month and also been in St Andrews for um, a week in the middle and, and we'll be heading up to Hospital Field at the end of this house and at, at the end of this week in our growth. Um, the Race, Rights and Sovereignty series was established as a partnership between the Glasgow School of the Art School, GSA Students Association and the GSA Public Lecture series. It seeks to se celebrate, challenge, inform and inspire the next generation of artists, designers and architects about race and empower them to have a creative voice. Um, so we're all together really been really delighted to host Lysandro here in, in this past month. There's just a few people to thank, um, a lot of people to thank. So Ken Neal and Ray Bushell from GSA and the Students Association. Um, David, Eve, Annie and Kitty from Lux. Lucy Byatt and Cicely Farrer from Hospital Field. Catherine Spencer and Karen Brown from St Andrews. Uh, the team at British Council Scotland. Jessica Cardin and Tiffany Boyle from Mother Tongue. Um, and all the artists have been um, extremely generous in looking after Lysandro this week. Lot of, lots of artists have been working with Lysandro the last month um, in Glasgow. Uh, Sabina, um, assistant curator, the team at CCA, and of course, Lysandro. Um, so today's talk, Ghost Island, um, exploring decolonial imagination. Um, Lysandro, for those of you who don't know, is a photographer born and raised in St. Martin, an island in the Dutch Caribbean. And his work responds to magic, surrealism, fiction and dreams, dreamscapes. Initially studying at the Academy of Art in The Hague, he received his Master's in art, Artistic Research and Art Studies from the University of Amsterdam, with his graduate thesis in analysing early 20th century illustrations of Caribbean mythology in relation to cultural aphasia. And for his Tilting Axis Fellowship Lecture, uh, Lysandro welcomes you to Ghost Island, inviting explorations of the relationship between imagination and decolonisation. Um, his ongoing project, Ghost Island, departs from a personal quest to discover decolonial truths of identity, whilst being posited as a device for reconfiguring collective history. Adrift at sea, Ghost Island came to be when the Ethiopian Sea changed its name to the Atlantic Ocean, and with it displaced a plethora of memories offering up a much-needed sub subaltern perspective on post-coloniality. Studiel challenges the orthodox institutions of knowing that perpetuate a hegemonic paradigm through deconstructing the black imagination. What does it mean to decolonize and where do we begin? So thank you very much, Alessandro, for all your work and your care and uh, for delivering this lecture today. So hi everyone, welcome. I'm going to 
talked very informally today because there's a lot of information that I want to give you guys and there's a limited amount of time. So there's some parts that I'm going to be reading and then the rest I'll just t tell you about. So we're going to go with the flow through the presentation. And I want to begin by showing you um, the trailer for the project Ghost Island, the video. I think it's a, a good um, example to show you what I've been doing and how this is expressed. Yes. They recorded it in their history and nuggets. Okay, well, we'll skip that for now then. We'll just continue the presentation. So I'm going to read now the introduction, how I feel about this, um, this topic and how I, the perspective from which I approach um, Ghost Island. As a person of color, a black person, the post-colonial condition does not make sense. It is a place where you are left with mere fragments of shattered histories to reconstruct an identity that has been erased through violence. There seems to be a continuum of intelligent imagination in fluctuation with our daily realities that feed our collective subconscious. I am here to show you that if you are able to tap into this, then magic can be an essential component for the production of things to know. One just has to understand and map out how this continuum speaks to you in order to interact with it. Rather than being something static, identity is dynamic and subject to the realms of ontologies. I am here to tell you a story that is rooted in what seems to be a bifurcation of realities. Some people experience one reality as real and the other as phantasmal imagination, while others consider the same imaginative realm as unequivocal truth. And I hope that with this lecture today, you can see how, by elucidating this junction between realities, we can come to understand where the process of decolonization begins. So I would like to start by introducing myself again to give you a little bit of context with regards to what I will be talking about today. Imagination in relation to decolonization, which is a glimpse into my ongoing project, Ghost Island. <coughs> so. My name is Lisandro Suvial. I was born and raised in St. Martin. That is a very tiny <coughs> island in the Caribbean situated around here. It's so small it's not on most maps. Um, what you see here is very interesting. It's an island, it's a map of the Caribbean <coughs> with all the indigenous names of the islands. So th none of these islands, um, if you look up these names, you probably won't find these islands. So what is interesting, why, why I want to show this map, is that when you talk about identity politics in the Caribbean, um, what constitutes that, you really have to dig into um, the history of the place, and that includes the name. Because a lot of, with the advent of Western imperialism, a lot of the name, these names have been erased and replaced with European names, such as my own island, St. Martin, which is not on the map, but the indigenous name, there are two indigenous names to my island, um, one by the Arawaks, um, Sualiga, which means land of salt, and the other by the Caribs, Ualichi, which means land of powerful women. Here you see how complex um, the, the geopolitical situation has become in the Caribbean. Because when you think of the Caribbean, People call it by many names. Well, I don't know if you're familiar. People call it the Antilles, the West Indies, the Caribbean. What are all of these names in relation to each other? So here I try to um, make a table 
of how I understand these relations to be. So then you have like here the, the Caribbean, which is like the umbrella of the region, the umbrella term of the region. And then within that, you have the West Indies, which includes all the islands. And then within the islands, you have distinctive regions, Greater Antilles, Lucayan Archipelago, which is like above Cuba, all those islands, Turks and Caicos, Bahamas. And then you have what is not part of the West Indies, but is in the Caribbean. You have um, like the Central American coastline, the South American coastline, um, and the islands that belong to that. Also, what is interesting um, when you talk about the Caribbean, because the Caribbean sometimes seems to be more of a cultural idea or an associative thing, because then you have, when you look at the map here of the Caribbean, so this is the typical map, everything that touches the Caribbean Sea is the Caribbean, and then you have the West Indies, which is the islands, um, also the Bahamas up here, Turks and Caicos Islands, the Lucayan Archipelago, but you also have, if you look down here, you see that these three countries, Guyana, Suriname, and French Guyana, they're not even touching the Caribbean Sea at all, but they're still considered part of the Caribbean. So this is to show you what that the, the Caribbean, the region, comes with complex ideas uh, regarding identity. And also, within those identities, hidden within those identities, are a lot of secret, complex, overlapping histories that are yet to be discovered. When I gave my talk in St. Andrews, I gave um, a kind of, well, fun fact, but is a not so fun fact, about Margarita Island, which is an island that belongs to Venezuela. It is just above it. It's part of the Caribbean, but not of the West Indies or anything. But that, during colonial times, that island was known as the Pearl Coast. And that comes with a very interesting history, because what that meant was that the Spaniards, it was a Spanish territory, they had employed slave divers to dive down for pearls. And this is a very, no one really talks, when people talk about slavery, they don't talk, they don't talk about slave divers. This is like, what, what is this? And then when you really dig into what the Caribbean is, what belongs to it, then you realize that there are little stories hidden in the crevices of that region. And those slave divers, the story behind that is that just before slavery, during the Middle Ages, a lot of Europeans, through the dogmatic Christianity, they kind of lost their ability to swim. Um, this is because there was a lot of nudity involved with swimming around that time, and that went against the, the dogma of the church. So a lot of people sailed in the ocean during the, the Renaissance, they didn't know how to swim. So they employed slave divers, for example, to get the treasures that they lost in shipwrecks, or sunken ships, or to save the captain if he fell overboard, or anyone who fell overboard, and Margarita Island to dive down for pearls. And this was especially a cruel form of slavery because slaves were forced to go down to depths that were not healthy. They would come back up with their ears bleeding. Um, they would have to fight sharks sometimes. And then as a reward for getting pearls, they would be given alcohol, which is not good because they would have to go dive down again. And after consuming alcohol, this is not the best um, thing to do. So yeah, that's a short side note on the Caribbean. So this is St. Martin. It's 37 square miles, population of more or less 70,000. Um, you can see the ocean from almost everywhere. It is, for, it is famous for this beach right here, Maho Beach, where you can stand under a 747 jet as it's landing or get jet blasted. I have never done it. My mother wouldn't let me do it. I'm going to continue and show you a video of how St. Martin used to be in like the 40s and 50s, just to give you an idea of the historic context of St. Martin. The video is in Dutch. Um, it's also interesting to see because St. Martin is an Anglophone island, 
but it is half Dutch, half French. Um, the laws are written in Dutch. We have a relationship with the Netherlands. We are an independent country within the Kingdom of the Netherlands, which is a little complicated to say. Um, I can speak Dutch, that's because my mother is Dutch, but most of the island population, they don't speak it. If you go to the island you can only speak Dutch, you won't get anywhere. Actually, you have more luck if you speak Spanish, because that's the second most prevalent language, at least on the Dutch side. On the French side, they do speak French, but on the Dutch side, it's mainly English. So, this is a very um, colonial con con <coughs> video. There are subtitles. <laughs> De grens van de Atlantische Oceaan en Caribische Zee, in de gordel der Antillen, ligt Sint Maarten. En eenzaam, aan een baai, uitgestrekt over een zandrug, de enige plaats, de hoofdplaats, Philipsburg. Vele mensen die hier wonen, worden onderhouden door familieleden, die werken op Curaçao en Aruba. Maar enkelen vinden een bestaan in de visvangst. Dadelijk na aankomst wordt de vangst op het strand verkocht waarbij sommige klanten de zee ingaan om het eerst aan bod te zijn. Philipsburg telt ongeveer duizend inwoners van gevarieerde oorsprong. Het bestuur van het eiland ligt in handen van een gezaghebber, boven wiens huis altijd de Nederlandse vlag wappert. Ja, Nederlands is de vlag, maar Engels is de voertaal. Vandaar dat dit gedenkteken, opgericht ter herinnering aan het bezoek van prinses Juliana aan het eiland, een Engels opschrift draagt. Vroeger was de zoutwinning een belangrijke bron van inkomsten, maar toen deze verviel, heeft men de laatste voorraad tot algemeen gebruik opgeslagen. En van de zoutsiederij? staan nu nog maar enkele brokstukken overeind. Brokstukken uit het verleden. Een verleden dat nog andere herinneringen naliet. Het Fort Amsterdam met zijn antieke kanonnen. Resten van plantages die hier eenmaal bloeiden en het bestaan verzekerden van vroegere bewoners van Sint Maarten. Maar vergeten is hun werk. Vergeten is de welvaart die hier eenmaal heerste. Vergeten zij die hier geleefd hebben. Maar dit is de toekomst van Sint Maarten. En misschien brengen zij het eiland tot nieuw leven. Het onderwijs wordt met het oog op de heersende taal in het Engels gegeven. So I'm going to stop and give an insert about the education on St. Martin. I went to a Dutch school, public school, on the island. And there you're in, you're sitting in a class with people from various different backgrounds. So you have people from Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Guyana, whatever. Um, people with like Chinese parents, from, parents from India. And everybody 
speaks English as a lingua franca. Um, for some people, English at home is even a second language because people speak their um, own language, either Spanish, Chinese, um, French patois, at home with their families. Um, but then in school, we speak English. And in first grade, um, everything's taught to you in English. And you start learning Dutch through like words, pictograms. So you have like pictures of like a car, a horse, a house, and you slowly learn Dutch that way. You're like about four or five years old in first grade. And second grade is the same thing, you get into sentences. And by third grade, the whole curriculum is in Dutch. So, and this has become problematic when students struggle with the language because if you're already struggling with a certain subject in school, um, in English, then the language that you're struggling with or that's not native to you will not help in that situation. So I think this is a problem with this um, education system. But of course you can opt to put your children in an English school. Um, but more often than not, they still get placed in, in a Dutch um, education system. Where, and either way, in either um, in either curriculum, the local vernacular, which is kind of like a an acrolectic variation on English, a Caribbean um, vernacular with an accent, its own certain grammar, vocabulary structures, that is not seen as a valid way of speaking or using the English language. So that kind of does not validate. Um, the authentic Caribbean, the authentic St. Martin identity, it is seen as an incorrect way of speaking. And that is something that needs to be addressed because this is the way that people think. And language really influences how you think, how you act, how you learn. Um, and on top of that, within these education systems, we talk about history and identity that is not addressed at all or addressed from a very toxic point of view or root. For example, I never really learned anything much about my own history until this phase of my life when I'm actually like researching and have like my master's, my research master's degree, my bachelor's and everything. In in primary elementary education, secondary education, what we mainly learned was history about Europe and about North America. We learned about the Boston Tea Party, the Second and First World War. I found that when I came to the Netherlands to study, I was able to speak with everybody and join the conversation about their own histories, but I couldn't contribute in a way where I was giving my own history in relation to that, or even in relation to myself. The first thing, the only thing we learned about our history mainly is that our history started with Columbus discovering St. Martin on St. Martin's Day, and that they may or may not have been um, indigenous people there at the time. And the problem with that is, is, and that black people there came as slaves. And the problem is that when your history starts with slavery, then you have this like warped view, untoxic view of self, self-worth of the world, and everything from that point on seems like progress. So you're not asking the right, the right questions if you think that your history starts with slavery. So I, one of the f reasons why I was doing this project was like this question, like why don't I know things about where I'm from or about me or about my people or about my ancestors? So that's what I wanted to say. And as you see in this video, it is a very um, white colonial way of looking at their territories. They talk about um, the plantations that were once prosperous and that they're now forgotten. And then they show like gravestones of plantocracy. And this is a very problematic. And later in this video, there's like this cringy moment where they show, where is it? I think here, I'm gonna, yeah. It's in Simpson Bay, we're gonna play it. In an uithoek ligt the Simpson Bay. Here wordt een kreeften gevangen die geregeld per vliegtuig naar Curaçao gezonden worden. De mensen die hier wonen zijn blanken. Hun oorsprong ligt in het duister. En doordat ze steeds in een volkomen afzondering leefden, hebben ze zich nooit met andere bevolkingsgroepen vermengd. Ja, yeah. so it's like, where did the white people come from? Like, and then, 
it's like, and then they're like, they, because they were in a far off place, they didn't mingle with the rest of the population. This doesn't make sense on a 37 square mile island where you can see the ocean from almost everywhere. And I grew up close by, it's not that, it's not that far away from anything. It's like a, one of the main parts of the island. And then here you have this like um, 19th century adventure. Um, yeah, it's, it's really cringy to watch. So now we're gonna fast forward to the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> Good day, and welcome to beautiful St. Martin, delightfully Dutch, and fantastically French. 37 square miles. Notice the language changed. This is a tourist video, and it's American English because we cater to American tourism. Prize this lush, green, tropical paradise, which guarantees to have something for everyone. Our purpose is to show you where to go, what to see, and what to do. The St. Martin Chamber of Commerce proudly presents Everything St. Martin. <coughs> St. Martin is located 1,400 miles south of New York City and is only a three and a half hour jet ride to the scenic Lesser Antilles. Tourism is the major economy here and both the French and the Dutch practice it well. The island residents are polite, friendly, and enjoy having more and more visitors to their home every year. Welcome to St. Martin. Christopher Columbus is credited with discovering St. Martin in 1493 on St. Martin's Day. Little development took place during those early centuries due to the inhospitable Carib Indians who resided on the island. In the early 1630s, both French and Dutch settlers arrived developed the salt ponds, and raised tobacco and sugarcane, forming an economic trading base for the island. In 1644, Spain laid claim to the small domain, but soon felt it wasn't worth its salt and left. Local legend states that four Frenchmen and five Dutch crew hid on the island until the Spanish fleet departed. They agreed to join together and live in peace. As the story goes, each group selected one representative, positioned them back to back, and instructed them to walk the coastline. The Frenchman, only consuming French wine, walked faster than the Dutchman, who was said to have consumed Dutch gin. The two men met at Koopkoi, and the boundary was marked then as it exists today. Okay, so yeah, that's a little like folklore, like urban legend about how the island got divided. Because one side is bigger than the other. That's, that's, but you can notice how they talk about how hospitable people are and how we would love to welcome um, everyone to the island. This is um, a bit problematic in Caribbean identity because we seem to be serving or catering to the same West we were enslaved to. And I'll show you how a bit, I'll talk a little bit about that happen, how that happened. Let me go back to... So yeah. So what you see here, I don't know if you noticed the, the, the differences um, in the two videos, one was from the 40s and one went to the 80s, and there's already a difference in presentation. Um, here you see two parts of the island, of what we see Point Blanche in the 60s, and in 1950 we see Simpson Bay. This is where those uh, white people were from with an ominous background. And then I'm going to show you the next picture, which is those two exact same regions today, or today right before the hurricane, Hurricane Irma. This is that today, and that is within 50 years. So that's still like this the crazy thing that that's the generation of how fast that switch can go from this lifestyle, this way of living, to yeah. Tropical, super capitalistic way of living. How did we get here? Um, photography had something to do with that because after slavery, the after the after the abolition of slavery, I should say, the Caribbean had to be kind of repurposed for something new. What are we going to do? We can't have slaves there anymore. Um, we still need to make money, we still have all these land, these places, these colonies. 
So what can we do use it for? Tourism. But then the it's a little depressing when you have a landscape with plantations and where all this very cruel violence took place. So what they did is they rebranded or reshifted the landscape. So they imported um, what they thought suited their tropical aesthetics. Because especially in the British history, they used to have these like greenhouses with all these tropical plants, Kamer of Wonders, and they brought the palm tree to the Caribbean, these kind of things. Fruit, ven fruits um, plantations played a big role because they showed a lot of fruits in the images. And then along with that, they showed smiling or accommodating people of color to welcome uh, the people to the island. And this is one of those first cameras that played a role because it was a cheap camera, everybody could use it, and it played a role in the, post the postcard industry, which in turn, perpetu in turn perpetuated this tropical idea of the Caribbean. Because the endemic flora, or the, yeah, the endemic flora of the Caribbean, at least my island, isn't tropical, it's, it's not a tropical rainforest or anything. It's more of an evergreen forest, which is more dry, and so it can be a bit yeah, off-putting if you expect like this lush tropical island setting. So, yeah, and here like some, here's an example of the postcard. You see an old photo of um, someone taking a photo of um, a Jamaican garden for the purpose of making a postcard. And I would like to read an excerpt um, by Krista Thompson, who wrote um, a book called An Eye for the Tropics, which is a very interesting read if you're interested in the role photography played in the tropicalization of the Caribbean. So, in Eye for the Tropics, Krista Thompson defines the tropicalization of local landscapes during the 18th, 18th and 19th centuries as the Caribbean being I imaged for tourist consumption. She states that renderings of tropical landscapes are generated through a complex visual history to stress exotic ideals. Promotional videos from Caribbean islands show how the picturesque come to denote the archetypical dreamlike destination in which the beaches serve as the primary signifier of island life. And you can see that in the video that I just showed from the 80s. Not much has changed since then in the Caribbean promotional videos. The beach and palm tree postcard has propelled this visual notion. An early visual cultural form characterized by mobility and valued as image is message. Photography, postcards, travel magazines, and promotional films thus inherently contain generalized conceptions of inaccurate curiosities pertinent to the commodification of popular observation fixed around race, moors, landscapes, and clothing. And you can see, I'm going to show you some more examples of postcards that were taken during the 19th century. You see Spanish Town in Jamaica, you see the palm trees. They're not particularly endemic to the Caribbean. You see people, you see how the flora plays a role, the coconuts, the dress. These are actual postcards, by the way, from that time. Banana carries in Jamaica, 1907, so we're in the 20th century now. The beautiful washerwoman very accommodating smile. And then this is a stop for lunch. So this is like the fruit companies that played a role in the tropicalization of the Caribbean. And, and then you have these, a, a photograph of these people who were responsible for this tropicalization. And when you look at this photo, it is very reminiscent of that same era earlier that century where you had these adventurers going to um, the the heart of Africa to either um, um, make it m more of a Christian civilized society, but they also, during that time, it was a time of an adventure and discovery and of bringing back adventure stories. So now people could go on their own adventure stories in the Caribbean. And it was a, it was a very toxic um, exchange between ideas in different parts of the world. 
And these are some of those examples that people, or the book, some book publications that people were publishing around that time. So here you have a Dutch publication about Suriname, which states, it translates our West in image and word. So it's a very like possessive thing. Tales from Africa by Henry Morton Stanley, which is like black tales for white children, my dark companions and their strange stories. So this is that paradigm that was also set at the beginning of tourism. So this is a very problematic thing that we are basing our economies on in the Caribbean today and that we're not aware of. So, so why decolonize? So this popular, this popular visual culture in turn has its implications on local constructs of identity. The restructuring of the landscape was not necessarily beneficial, beneficial <coughs> to Afro-Caribbean peoples. Today, the lack of respect for Afro-Caribbean people continues with the proliferation of tropicalization, with the perpetual erections of resorts, casinos, spas, and other accommodations for the sake of Western consumerism. The subordination of endemic, way, endemic ways of life and heritage is masked and labeled with the term progress. The ordeal and devastation of the Atlantic slave trade, along with the realities of extended residency in the Caribbean, are deliberately erased from a framed ideal. This is why the process of decolonization is important. An answer to this problematic trait of the contemporary West Indian society is to reawaken the consciousness and concern for indigenous ways of knowing. Collective recollection is crucial for this and needs to take account of how people remember that which is meant to be forgotten and how to let the transmission and communication of hidden narratives take center stage. And how do we do this? How do we talk about, or how can we attain knowledge that is not taught to us through popular curriculum. Now we can get we can get all academia ask about it, and you can read stuff by Giatri Spivak on an aesthetic education, um, in, which, where, in which she states, in which she talks about harnessing the imagination for the production of things to know. Basically, she bases it on a book. She, by Frederick Schiller, um, on the aesthetic education of man, in which he says, without a sense of the beautiful, all revolutions that aim to free the individual from tyranny and oppression will fail. One must have experienced true beauty before one can experience true freedom. And it's talking about how um, kind of an aesthetic experience can give you knowledge in a way, because you interact with knowledge in the more freeing way than a rigid academic um, sense. And very important here is what she talks about. The problem <coughs> is not what to know, but how um, to know, to know things. So what she what she, what's Giat, 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 Gayatri Spivak talks about is that people don't really know. In, in today's world, there is so much information that we don't know what to do with it. So there's like this overload, and then you're not looking at the important bits of information anymore. You're just taking it in and not processing it. And what happens in this scenario is that is that data becomes a kind of currency rather than information that is actually benefiting you. So we see this today with this Cambridge Analytica scandal where they're just like harnessing everybody's data and people aren't, aren't aware of it, but they're taking part in the information stream anyway. So they're part of information, but they're not using the information. They're just contributing to it. And that's what turns data or information into a currency. And if anybody watched that documentary on Netflix about um, Cambridge Analytica, it's called The Great Hack, in that you see that what Giatri Spivak is talking about actually comes true as data being a currency, because data, according to this documentary, the value of that has surpassed the value of oil. 
And it was very interesting to think about in the context of how we deal with information. And then I'm here to talk to you today about how we can circumvent that in other ways. Um, and you might think that, um, so here you have the study, how can you train your imagination? So what um, Abby Warburg pr proposes in 1924, basically, he devised a kind of way of looking at images. It's basically juxtaposing images and images that kind of have an intuitive connection to each other. And you, you look at kind of the, the in-between zones, like you read in between the lines of the photos to find the connections, and that's where you excavate that secret knowledge. And I'm gonna show you that later in my own example. But it's a very playful way of um, doing research, basically, in a non-textual way. But when it comes to alternate ways of knowing, this is a very Eurocentric approach, it's very academic, but, there, but these ways of knowing has, have existed for much longer and come from other places, from very black places. And I want to take you to the realm of obia, the realm of black magic. Pronounced obia, the term for black magic, was recorded in the Caribbean sometime between 1710 and 1712 on the island of Barbados. This marked the beginning of the global misunderstanding of what we believe black magic to be. 18th century Europeans misinterpreted the unknowable spirituality of slaves as something rooted in malevolence. Their hate and fear of blackness has instilled such ignorance that to this day, obia still heavily connotes negativity, even for many people of color all around the world. This, this, this is the reason why obia and its synonym, black magic, have been reduced to represent a superficial practice of the occult. However, just as the story of blackness does not start with slavery, so does the story of obia. And accordingly, we may disregard the colonial accounts on Barbados for ourselves. Know that the true origins of black magic lay deep within the lands of the Igbo people and the Niger Delta. Here, the word obia occurs as part of a compound term, dibia, which is a contraction of two words, di, meaning master, and abia, meaning knowledge and wisdom. In Igbolan, the dibia, or obia, could communicate directly with the spirits and gain access to sacred ancestral knowledge. Therefore, obia, or black magic, is more than a stigma wrapped in occultism. They are concepts of a boundless higher and secret knowledge, let it be known that Africa, with her profound ways of knowing, has always fought the demons of Eurocentric paradigm. So, now we're going to take you to part two of the presentation, which is black imagination. And I would like to ask the audience, is, has anybody ever seen a ghost? Is this part called Ghost Island? We have one, two, three, four, five. Okay, more ghosts than in St. Andrews. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 yeah. So, yeah, so my project, Ghost Island, is uh, explore. So, I'm, as part of my project, I do interviews with people and ask them um, about the ghosts that they've seen, about their history and how they know about, how they know about their own histories, how they feel as um, people of color within their own context, if they identify as such. Before I continue, I want to show you um, a video of a storyteller from St. Martin. So you're going to get the St. Martin vernacular and feeling of St. Martin and black imagination all in one. So I'm very excited to show this to you. Um, just have to get it on the right time. Well, they, well, yeah, sorry. Um, imagination. So we go 126. So here she's going to talk to you about, uh, I, I selected this part because she's going to talk to, she's going to mention um, what imagination basically means to her. This is one of the questions I asked. <coughs> I, I believe this thing will join me. What people start, the old Samantha of a journey. It is I want. So, this is a storytelling artist based in St. Martin, and she's 
um, talking about a jumbi, and a jumbi is like a people see it as a malevolent entity in the Caribbean. It's basically an umbrella term for spirits in the Caribbean. So I'm going to start it a bit. Let me restart it. I, I believe there's no jumbi. Not for it is all worldwide. You hear ghosts. You hear the ghost stories all the most. Stories from Ireland, from England. These are the countries, Transylvania and all of that. You see, everybody that comes in this world has a great imagination. And imagination stems from a magical side of thought. The magic of thought. Now, stories of a ghost and thing. Yes. Some people want to take it to the nonsense, but there are ghosts. There are ghosts. Okay, now I'm going to fast forward to a very particular line that she mentioned in the interview when talking about ghosts. There, he only just got home when I moved up there. Sorry, that's black. Yeah, I'll this is true because when I was pregnant with my daughter, I used to sleep with the door open in our room. You could have done that then. Sleep with the door open. And something come and tell me, let's go to the picnic. The picnic? Yeah, at yeah, the picnic. We're going to the picnic? Picnic. And it's right in your hair, right? Yeah, yeah. It's right here. Yeah, okay, sorry, that was my sister in the background. She was present in the interview as well. We were all talk, having this heated discussion about ghosts. So what she said in the video is that while she was pregnant with her daughter, somebody, she slept with the door open, and it was like somebody came inside and whispered in her ear, let's go to the picnic. That's a really random sentence. And she didn't know what it meant. Because I was like, what? And I didn't know what it meant either, because I thought it was really random. A really random thing to say. Like, why would a spirit, if you believe in it or not, randomly say, let's go to the picnic? But then later on during my research, um, I chanced upon um, a line in a book about the history of St. Martin. And this is where things get a little interesting when it comes to ways of harnessing knowledge and what is the valid way to atta attain that knowledge, to collect that knowledge, is in olden St. Martin, blacks, whites, and whites referred to a picnic far away from the plantation or one's house. In other words, to Pinel Key, which is like an island nearby, as a maroon. So like a picnic was a code name for a maroon society to escape the plantation. So this is, this back and forth knowledge between the, hauntolo the hauntological past of the Caribbean, the very real ghosts um, that haunt us, and the information that they can feed. And I think this is a very um, nice introduction about what I'm going to talk about today, which is my own case of a picnic revelation. Sorry? Yeah. So I'm going to go into it real fast. So basically, I had a very vivid dream. And in this dream, I, um, I, was being, I was in a tornado. And I was being spun around. And I looked up, and there was this disc in the sky full of like, eyes. It, was, it looked like a hurricane. And then the tornado disappeared. And then there was a man on an empty road um, in this other realm, because the sky was like pinkish, pearly, white. And this man was wearing a turban, Middle Eastern garb, blue and gold. And he wasn't really human. He was like, he had like no nose, no mouth, just like <coughs> eyes. And, but he looked familiar. He looked like I should know him. And I was like, who is this man? This happened in Brazil while I was doing my work there for the project. And this is kind of how the scenario looked. So this was a man who was standing next to a cow. That's not very important for now. 
Um, so this is how I pictured myself within the tornado. And then the next day when it happened, I went out and I photographed it. I did, I gave him, I did a photographic interpretation of dream. And this is something, he looked something like this. It's not exact though, because he had no face, but I did my best to interpret it. And then I started working with him in the space. And this is the image that I think um, kind of describes him the best visually, also the feeling that I had. And when I created this image, I was like, he looks familiar. He kind of looks like um, this Brazilian folkloric figure, Sassi Perere, which you can see here, um, which is like this entity that hops around on one leg and has a red cap. And there are different versions of him. Sometimes he's like as dark as coal, and he's said to be a trickster figure. Um, but I thought it was all just coincidence. And I was like, okay, it's cool, one leg. And he looks like he's on one leg because he's like jumping here. But I thought it was like an uncanny um, resemblance. But then later on, a few months later, I again chanced upon this um, information while I was doing other research. And I already knew that the, the one leg in this um, association with Sassi Perere, that was no, no biggie. But then I saw that he was associated with whirlwinds. And then I came back to my dream, and I was like, oh, this is very strange, that this is this is like coincidence. Um, so I was like, so then I started to take a, a closer look at what was going on and who Sassi Perere was. And Sassi Perere, um, the, the story behind him is that if you see a whirlwind, what you do is you take a sip, and you put it on the whirlwind, and you have him caught. But if you want to keep him, you put him in a bottle. And then you can keep him as long as you want. If you're nice to him, depending or not, when you release him from the bottle, he comes out and he can grant you a wish. And what does this remind you of? Aladdin. Yes, the genie. And what are one of the main influences in Brazil? Um, a lot of um, Brazilians came, a lot of um, slaves that came, or enslaved peoples that came in through Brazil were from a Muslim region, mm -hmm. the Senegambia region of Africa. So then you have this like interesting play with mythologies and influences. So you're like, okay, when did Sassi Perere come to Brazil? And when did he turn into a genie? So here, so this is what I was talking about earlier. So you have slaves imported from three areas on the west coast of Africa, Senegal, Ibarra, Benin, and Angola. All these regions had a lot of Muslim influences. These Muslim influences played a critical role in slave revolts in Brazil. So this is very important. It's not something that's talked about popularly, but it played a big role in slave revolts. Um, yeah, so this is the region where they come from, the Gambia region. But where, where, where does this Islam start? Islam start in this region of, in this region of Africa because, um, yeah, so in about 300 BC you have um, the introduction of the camel, and then people from Arab countries were able to cross to the Sahara and do trade with sub-Saharan Africa's, and then you had people, Arabian people, Arabian merchants that set up camp there in sub-Saharan Africa, and they became this kind of aristocracy, and they um, they mixed with the people culturally um, and, and spiritually as well, and in Islam, there wasn't really room for uh, all the deities of the, the sub-Saharan African people because they believed they had this like animist belief system. So they believed that everything had a spirit, like all the trees, all the flowers, all everything had a spirit. Um, and in Islam, there was no room for this because there was only one God, Allah. But as a compromise, there is like a loophole in Islam because in Islam, and they talk about genies and genies are these like um, spirits, they're not human and they're not gods, but they're spirits nonetheless that are present and that may or may not be real. But they had converted to Islam when they heard the Prophet read the Quran. Mm -hmm. so, so all the animistic um, deities um, in Sub-Saharan Africa from these people were then tur like, turned into genies in a way. I think this is a very interesting way to look at um, Sassi, in a sense. And then this is a comparison of 
this um, Senegambian, actually it was the empire of Mali, one of the greatest <laughs> empires in the world, um, where this like melange of African and Arabic um, religions coalesced. So I'm going to fast forward then to, but how does and when could this cross, um, cross Atlantic cultural exchange existed? Because in Africa, what is very interesting is that these, these, um, sorry, lost the word, these genies, yeah, these genies, the jinn, they lived in very particular places. They lived in a certain tree called the silk cotton tree. And this is a very interesting tree because it is present in both Africa and in the Americas and the Caribbean. And the Caribbean, I don't know if you remember, Miss Butte was talking about jumbies in the video, these entities. This is a silk cotton tree. So you can see it's a massive, so you can understand why there's superstition around it. But in the Caribbean, jumbies are said to live in silk cotton trees. And they're like, okay, when there's another cultural exchange um, taking place here. And even more interestingly, if you go further back in history, the silk cotton tree was also central to um, ancient Mayan civilizations, where it was the tree of the cosmos. So you're like, when did um, this African-American ex cultural exchange take place? And then you get to stories like from medieval Mali, there was said to be a king, King uh, Abu Bakari, who was said to cross the Atlantic on an expedition to see what was on the other side, and he was never to return. But around this time, you start finding um, relics of Africanisms um, in Mesoamerica, such as the Olmec heads, for example. Um, at the end of the presentation, I have a whole web diagram with influences, so we can take a look at that there if there's time. Um, so here we get to Mesoamerica. And then, what about that hurricane figure I saw in the dream? This is also very interesting because I looked up, because um, when you talk about the Mayan, when you talk about a hurricane, the word stems from the Mayan god for the wind and storm, which is Huracan. And he is associated with nature, with the hurricane. And in the Mayan language, his name, which is in interested, means one-legged. And he's sometimes personified as a god with one leg. So this is a very uncanny series of coincidences to have in one dream. And it's because of this dream that I went to excavate this kind of knowledge. So this dream has some academic standing, but it, is, it has inspired a, a journey through uh, a way of knowing that isn't necessarily valid through an, in an academic sense, but it has led, it has been fruitful in its results nonetheless. So then we have in this story, the story of the genie, you have Sassi Perere, and you have the jinn. And they all have very obvious similarities associated with the whirlwinds, associated with weather, because genies were also associated with um, storms and winds in the desert. And here we have, I show you like the final web that came from my dream of how, well this is half of it, of Sassi Perere, the Jinn, Huracan, the Jambi, the silk cotton tree that's kind of central to it all. And then you have the, the let me read till that goes away, the Mexican, so it was where the Mayan civilization, all Mexican civilization is, and the, the medieval empire of Mali, so pre-Columbian, and all the things that they have in common. I'm going to zoom in more. So the, the, uh, the cultural, uh, the elements they have, in common, cultural elements they have in common is they both have feathered serpents in their mythologies, they both um, were into cotton, they both had winged discs, and this is just a few, because it's not even everything, they both had rain makers that were central to their um, belie belief system, spiritual practices, um, they both had arabesque talismans, the silk cotton tree um, was a central figure to their pantheon, um, they both had um, the starry, you know, the the starry magician's hat, the wizard hat that Merlin has, is actually African origin. Um, they both had this already in pre-Columbian societies. They both had things that could be described as voodoo dolls. 
they all had a zodiac divided into 13, and they both had a belief or something of a werewolf in there. So like these, this is very interesting to look at um, black history from this perspective, because then you call into question, or I could call into question, we all can, um, when we, like who are my ancestors? Did my ancestors come as, as enslaved people, or were they the ones there before? And this kind of, this really complicates Caribbean identity and is adds a whole nother layer to it. Because this means that the, the first African diasporas were not um, by European hands, but it was uh, on our own accord. And this is very important for identity. And even if you go back before this, before that's a whole nother discussion, um, the oldest bones, or some of the oldest bones in in South America, for example, you have in Brazil, um, there's Lucia. They named her after Lucy. But the fossils of Lucia um, was the, the oldest remains of a, a woman. Um, in, in popular dating on Google will show that she's about 7,000 to 10,000 years old. Um, but if you read academic texts, which are really hard to find about her, there are researchers that say that she's much older that she's 70 to 100,000 years old, these bones. So this is also like something that has been proposed. And what is interesting, they did a reconstruction of this woman, Lucia. And do I have a photo of her? Yes, I do have a photo of her. So Lucia. And she's a black woman from, um, from, South, from South Africa, from the San people. So yeah, so this is even, this is really the earliest African diaspora that we, that we know of, arguably. So we really have to reevaluate what we know of black history about the African diaspora and reconfigure that history. And that's what I want to leave you with today and how the imagination feeds into that decolonial process. Thank you so much. That was really amazing, rich, layered, informative, spiritual, magical presentation. So thank you. Um, I have a few questions, but I'm also not going to ask them because immediately, just in case anyone has uh, wants to speak just now. So I'll just give you a, a, a second or two to kind of prepare some questions. Um, also, while I remember there were a couple of omissions from my introduction, and I just wanted to thank um, also Anna Lee Davis and Holly Bino, who are our sort of um, core Tilton Axis partners in the Caribbean, um, and also the, the Tilton Axis partners um, in general, um, who, um, I, who we really couldn't have delivered this without, and they were they've just been amazing. So thank you. Um, but any questions for now? Okay. So. I have uh, one or two. Um, you just touched on that at the end there, um, but I wanted to speak a little bit about um, how you deal with history in your work and um, how, particularly how you're acknowledging history without perpetuating violence or um, trauma, which I think you have lots of strategies in. So, um, but it's obviously a tense thing to sort of look, to go, to go back into history and to try to um, revisit and and you're using these strategies like mythology and fairy tale and dreaming um, in order to sort of listen to your ancestors um, and you also spoke um, previously to us about a book that you read um, called uh, They Came Before Columbus um, by Ivan Van Sertima um, so my question is really how do you find it difficult in your work to pay homage to the past um, because it's not only the future, but the past that needs decolonized. And can you speak more about this, particularly because I think there's a tension and it's not so much about going back to find to the beginning. It's not about finding a beginning or who was first, or it's about this expansion of the imagination, the expansion of identity <coughs> and in order to sort of um, think forward. So yeah. could you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I do my best in my work not to depart from the slave narrative, <coughs> I think that's something that is um, quite the go-to thing to do when talking about black history, 
and it's something that is we're constantly reminded of because you can not know anything about history as a black person but you still know that you come from slavery and i think that is a very weird way to base identity on so explicitly in my work i try to really start from a place that's deeper than that um where who were we before that because like, yeah we are one of the oldest we are the oldest um, people on the planet and then talk about there's a history that needs to be reclaimed because we've been kind of written out of history because the same people that kind of the same people that enslaved us are the ones that were responsible for writing history as well and then there's going to be there can be a lot of backlash these days about because um, people will be sensitive to this rewriting or reconfiguration of history um, but it's not reclaiming some people might experience it as history being taken away from them um, but it's not about that because if you really talk about decolonization it is not about stealing history back because history has already been stolen it's been stolen from us but it's about um, sharing history so um, your Europe or European paradigms have to share the history because Europe comes from blackness, it comes from black civilization, based on a lot of Egyptian ways of doing things. It's about sharing history, and it's only experienced as stealing history if that colon colonization or that history of colonization, that hegemonic paradigm, if that if they want to keep perpetuating that, only then will it be experienced as something being taken away from them. But it's just adding to the narrative from a different perspective. And that perspective, I think, shouldn't be rooted in something that is fundamentally academic. Because that doesn't make sense with um, indigenous ways of knowing. Because that's like not validating entire groups of people and the way they understand the world. So kind of departing from a place that is not academic, I think opens up so many avenues for discovering and talking about identity. Because you can't decolonize from within the structure that oppresses you. So that's why I kind of have this very open-minded approach to learning about history that is still fruitful and beneficial for my artistic practice. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Um, I don't really necessarily have a question. It's just um, I just want to thank you so much for articulating the way that you work in this way because I feel like this is something that I've been doing for a really long time quite naturally, kind of picking from different things, working intuitively, um, like speaking to people and building knowledge in a, di in a different way. And it's always felt like it was not acceptable because it's not in this like academic framework but it's actually really inspiring to like hear someone say in a very clear way this is actually like a very um legitimate way to work and um so many of the things that you've picked up on and what you've said today is like actually pinging back to like information that i've been picking up over the last couple of years so i really want to like thank you for that Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I, I was, guess I was interested in the aspect of the ghost figure, uh, both as a you know a present absence of someone who's not there, or a spirit that's there, or a, a culture that's not there. How that fits in with you? as the author who are um, taking lots of elements, one for a better word, and, and filling in that space. I think uh, traditionally, certainly in the UK, that sense of artists from the Caribbean, whose background is in the Caribbean, maybe been born here, is about that longing and absence, how you fill that in. You don't have the colonial, colonialist voice to fit it in through, you know, it, it may be elements of anthropology that have fitted that have dropped in that space, Tarzan movies that are based on ethnographic movies of real people performing their real culture. Um, so I was just wondering how 
don't know if it's a question or a, a confused conversation about how you feel in the absence. I'm thinking of ghosts as being a presence of someone who's not there, or a whole culture of 500 mm. years that's there yeah. and not there at the same time. And how you feel that in as the author that's guiding us a different, on a different journey. That's, that's very interesting because that, that I, I must say that this project is still in its beginnings. And for me, it's a, it's a journey. It's a journey because I don't know about my own past. So there's a, definitely a gap there, a hauntological gap. And when you talk about hauntology, you, have, you talk about a haunting from both the past and an anticipated future, because you don't know what can happen in the future. So this is a longing for a better future that can take place. So there's, there's two gaps to kind of fill in, and you're moving along those two in the present. Um, so my project stems from that perspective, and it also stems from my own personal experiences with the specter, with the ghosts. Um, because um, I, along with other people in this room, other people in the Caribbean, um, have experienced certain entities um, that have appeared before us, and there's a firm belief in it. And then you think about, what does this mean? And how can you talk about it? Because you, you sometimes you feel like you're a nutcase for even bringing it up, or bringing it up in an academic setting. Mm. But these things are happening nonetheless, and they're being documented by um, a myriad of people. Um, and often it's approached from an anthropological perspective, but not from a perspective that can be deemed as a way to harness knowledge. And this is something that I kind of want to revamp in a way, with the example I gave of the picnic, and my own example of my dream. Um, I, I call it imagination in relation to decolonialism. Um, but for some people, it's spirituality. For some people, it's intuition. Um, I call it imagination. But it's just a different way of going about um, filling in that gap. And that's where I, I'm, um, that's how I work as an author. Because of the imagination, we, we talk about imagination. I think it's a key to so many things. It can be a key to a spirit world. It can be the key to the production of knowledge in the sense that the imagination is all about what we saw in the atlas. Um, it's about making a logical connections and, and kind of constructing or reconstructing and understanding the links between these a logical um, associations and connections. Um, for example, um, being here in Scotland during this fellowship, I am fascinated with um, standing stones, for example. And then you start to think about this fantasy of who, who built these, when were these built? And you talk about a Neolithic past, a Stone Age past. But then you also have my atlas here about the standing stones. And I can pass it around the room. But there's like a map in here somewhere. Hold on, I got it right here. And it's like, it's pretty big. But like, it's like all dots all over the world where you find these standing stones. And even in this um, narrative, the standing stones, people, when people talk about standing stones, they talk about the most important standing stones in the world, like Stonehenge, all European stones. But they're in the Amazon, they're in India, they're in Africa, they're everywhere, much older than the ones here. So you're talking about, and we're talking about the Stone Age, you're talking about over 5,000 years ago. Whiteness, white people, only have existed for the last 5,000 years. And this is when it's written in history, coincidentally, when civilization began. So this is, this is kind of weird. So that means the human, the anatomically modern human is like 200,000 years old, at least. And we talk about this before 5,000 years ago, you're talking about people of color. So it's a bit racist to assume that for almost 200,000 years, black peoples, people of color, were sitting on their ass around the campfire not doing anything. <laughs> people like you and I, can you imagine doing that your whole life? You just sit around the campfire and not be creative, and you're living in a society? That doesn't make sense. So when you have the stone age structures, and it's very, and I find it interesting that this is something that people seem to be very proud of here, but it is a remnant, it is a legacy of a black colored civilization. And when you start to think about it in this way, then you can realize what sharing history actually means. So, and then in my work then, I'm, also, I'm trying to play with this imaginative aspect and trying to imagine what these people may or may not have looked like because it's, that's where the imagination comes into. into. 
I hope that kind of, yeah. I guess sort of like it's like following on from that. Um, maybe it's a question or like a comment or like uh, maybe if you have like more things to say. I'm like thinking a lot like around like blackness and indigeneity and like how like in lots of um, it feels like fairly recent that like the sort of like delineation between those are like being collapsed. Like I think. Um, like in terms of like organizing, <coughs> there's like lots of like talking around like, uh, like black people like organizing in solidarity with like indigenous people and like um, like I feel like only like at least for me like it feels like fairly recent that um, people are like, also talking about like black people being like indigenous yeah. people too. Yeah. Uh, I think it's very interesting then for you to read Ivan Constantino's work. They came before Columbus. Oh, yeah. uh, we have the PDF. I think we're putting it in the archive here at um, CCA. So it might be interesting read for you because Ivan Constantino he talks about a um, black presence in pre-Columbian America, mm -hmm. and he's very contested in the academic yeah, world the um, because people don't like to deviate from this very um, conservative idea of history. But, and they, they make him out to be like a pseudoscience or a nut case. But this man was on the panel for the Nobel Prize, and he did all these super academic things, written so many things. And then when he talks about an alternative black history, that's when they want to cancel him out. So it's a very, the historiography is something also to be very critical and aware of. And in his book, he talks about, because he talks about medieval Mali, um, how these kings, like King Abu Bakari, went on a voyage to, so he's talking about a medieval presence, medieval <coughs> black presence that fed um, the culture in the Americas. Because for those of you that don't know what Olmec heads look like in Mesoamerica, this is what they look like. So you're talking about very African features in Mesoamerica a very long time ago. And in, 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 in his book, Colum he has some passages from Columbus's journal or from people that were with him, and they talk about how there were already black people there that they were seeing, but that somehow got left out of the popular retelling of the story. There were already black elements there. There was a certain gold that was there. It was like 32 parts. Um, wait, do I, I have it here somewhere? I can give you the exact number. It's like, wait. I can't find it, but it's like a, it's a certain gold alloy, which is very specific components of copper, um, silver, and gold, and they called it guanine, and the, the Indians had it, and they gave it to Columbus um, when he just arrived as a gift, and this same gold was found in medieval Mali, and it was very peculiar because they said that it contained a certain amount of copper because... Um, According to the journal, he said black people like to smell their wealth because they had gave off a certain smell. And they also had a name that derived from Guani in this part of the world. So it's a, it's a history that is linked and needs to be excavated more and take, be taken more seriously. Was he the person who gave out so much gold that like, saved the lives of the That's King Mansa Musa. And that's the person that came after. Um, Abu Bakari. So Abu Bakari um, was a very powerful man. Um, he was very curious. He had like, he just went with all his ships and he wanted to discover what was on the other side of the Atlantic. And then somebody had to take his place as a leader and he appointed um, Mansa Musa as, his, as the new king. And he's the one that's said to be the wealthiest man that has ever existed in the world, and he's the one that destabilized economies by giving out so much gold. So, yeah. And the person who wrote again for Columbus is that the person who, like, to prove the point, like, built the, like, rebuilt the boat to, like, show that, like, a boat. There's, like, someone who, like, um, like, doing that same sort of thing because they, like, found, like, cocaine in, like, the stomachs of people, and then they, like, to, like, I don't know, something that they tried to to show that like that journey like was possible at that time mm -hmm. they like rebuilt like the 
I, I don't think he did that particularly, but he does talk about a lot of boats and the, how easy it actually is to cross the Atlantic. From It's easier to cross the Atlantic from the west coast of Africa than it is from Europe, because that's how the currents flow. Africa, there, and back up. Um, and that basically, if you were to get lost on the boat off the west coast of Africa, you would just drift to the Americas on your own. And all you would have to do would be able to fish and survive. So if you're an actual sailor, it is a no, um, no hassle mission. And the sea is actually very calm, out of hurricane season. <laughs> Thank you. Um, because you mentioned the connection with the um, huracan and also in the current context in the Caribe, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about how this kind of knowledge making and visioning the world and existing in the world and relating to history might also, um, if you have anything to share about how it's used, for example, in the wake of the hurricanes in uh, the Caribbean. Oh, that was an interesting question. I'm not sure if I can answer that because the whole the whole reason of doing of my doing this project is well, I can't speak for the whole Caribbean. I can only speak from where I'm from, and I know where I'm from my experience of that, because again, I can't speak for everybody, has been that this connection has been lost. So that, that link to that attaining knowledge in that way has been severed. And that's what I'm more here to kind of talk about, is to kind of rekindle that connection with um, ancestral knowledge, in a way. And you can look at hurricanes as a very angry spiritual entity and, and be playful with the fact, and we're going to play with this fact also. It is, it is an entity that crosses the middle passage. Um, so it's like a very angry um, passage, and a very angry space in the Caribbean. And the same people um, that have suffered um, in that diaspora are still suffering now at the hands of the hurricane. So it's just like perpetual reminder of having been brought there and the consequences of that. So, and now in the, the whole global warming, um, climate catastrophe thing, we're gonna, we're going, we're, get, we're heading towards a climate apartheid, which is all the borders are closing, um, things are going haywire in certain regions of the world, very specific regions of the world. It reminds me of when I was in, I like to say this, when I was in my master's, um, in my globalization and, and narrative class, there was a professor who had went to a conference, conference-esque type thing, and they were talking about environmental things and industries, and there was one person, a company, that gave a presentation about, this was a while ago, a few years back, they gave a presentation about drilling in the Arctic for oil, and it was, it was something relatively new at the time, and she, after the presentation was over, she pulled him to the side and she asked, drilling in the Arctic for oil, isn't that, isn't that going to have devastating consequences for the environment and the world? And then his answer was like, yeah, 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 of course, but don't worry about it because yes, it's going to have devastating effects for the world, but you don't really want to live in those places anyway. And now fast forward to now, we have like this climate catastrophe that's happening and they have these like haywire immigration policies that we're following for God knows what reason that are keeping people out and they're keeping people in certain spaces and keeping yeah it's a it's a it's a problem. So yeah. I don't know if I answered your question but it started a <laughs> the discussion. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks again for this really awesome talk. Um, I kind of was wondering a little bit about how you use the environment in your work. If I can just like briefly talk about myself. I, I graduated with a bachelor's in environmental science mm -hmm. and uh, in the States. Um, and I guess I, I barely graduated with it because I just I was having just a really hard time grasping all these core concepts yeah. that are based in environmentalism right now. And yeah. that's like 
math and chemistry and physics and all this stuff that I just couldn't wrap my brain around. Mm -hmm. And for years and years, people would tell me, like, Claire, like, why are you doing environmental science if you're terrible at all this stuff? And so I think for a long time, there's just been one kind of view to environmentalism, and that's been a very scientific one. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm an artist myself, and I, I'm a painter, and in my work, I'm trying to show people of, cover, of people of color who have agency and who have historically throughout time had agency and shaped the land and shaped a, like who belong in outdoor spaces because I think right now like the these outdoor spaces nature is is, is a very like very white space in many mm -hmm. ways and in, 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 in the US um, we don't ever really think about people of color being outdoorsy being outside so a lot of my story as an artist has been to just kind of like show that there's more than one way of having a connection and having a valid a, like w like valid relationship with nature um, and so I'm just kind of wondering how you show a, like people of color having you know like 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 be yep yeah, like being in, in different landscapes and how how they are just like this this photo is incredible like how how they themselves have had agency and how they've had power no uh, well for me I in my work I also definitely work a lot with nature. Actually, nature is a very important component yeah. to my work. I think that um, nature allows for the imagination to breathe, in a way, because you never know what you're going to find. Mm -hmm. um, nature has a history of um, being spiritual. There are, um, for example, in the, the rainforest of South America, you have people that work with ayahuasca, for example, mm -hmm. and they yeah, you know the story where they take in like hallucinogens, hallucinogens to travel to the spirit world, mm -hmm. and it's a very specific um, concoction. So, um, those of you that are not familiar with ayahuasca, it is a root that is mixed with um, certain leaves or bark, but it's two very separate trees. Um, so, what the root does of the ayahuasca plant, it puts you into a hallucinogenic state. But if you would just eat it, nothing happens and this is where science comes in so you would eat it nothing happened because your the enzymes in your stomach break it down before you get a hallucination but when you add a, a certain plant a very specific plant like one in a billion in the rainforest and you add it it acts as an inhibitor to that enzyme and then you can experience that hallucination and then questions have been asked to these people like how did you know um, that these plants, that there were these two specific plants that can create this experience. And then their answer was, the, the trees told us. So then you have again, the imagination and nature at work and where knowledge comes from and how valid or believable it is to the Western mind. And yeah, and I think that having that as a point of departure, um, nature, also have, evokes this sense of like timelessness in a sense, but with the climate change, it might not <laughs> be that timeless anymore. Um, it might be quite anachronistic. <coughs> but yeah, it's something that I am also discovering and learning in my own practice. So, yeah. I think we have two more questions. <laughs> Hi, um, if you could just keep it quite short, that would be great. I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> Hi, yeah, thanks so much for, I really appreciated your placing side by side, um, I don't know what you would call them, the spiritual, cultural entities mm -hmm. side by side. This is a really interesting way to do your research and it's very exciting to see your process. Um, and the reason why I'm very interested in it is because when I first began working as an artist, I did a six month residency on the Isle of Skye in an institution where I was contractually obliged to only speak the Gaelic language, which, sorry if this is something you already know, but is uh, one of Scotland's, uh, in, uh, you could say indigenous languages, even though in Scotland I don't think people are comfortable using that term. Mm. What I noticed during this residency was that, uh, the, like you mentioned, the Calamy stones mm -hmm. and, and the older generation in who use that language are still mu surprisingly very, very in touch with the spiritual or uh, supernatural realm uh, through this language. Uh, and it's very incredible. But I think 
in a tenuous connection, I have a question for you surrounding uh, the fact that in, in Scotland we have a complicated relationship because we have internalised aspects of the identity of the coloniser and also the colonised at the same time, so it's very difficult for us to address questions about our own uh, diverse range of um, spiritual entities or cultural entities or however you want to call them, particularly when they are associated with a language that is rapidly dying out. I just wondered if you have any thoughts on that during your visit to Scotland, whether this is something that you've noticed or an atmosphere you've picked up on. This is a very interesting question and something I want to definitely get into and research, so thank you for the tip. because. Um, I'm here. I'm here in a residency for one month, and it is a very short time to do that kind of research. But I definitely want to come back and delve into that research. And then I can hopefully give you an update of what I find, because I can't give a concrete answer to that. I do know that language plays an important role in keeping contact with ancestors in the way of thinking and doing. Because in the Caribbean, you have a lot of Creole languages, which is a mix of different influences and that language already, by analyzing that language, you can already see what the historic influences are. Um, so that's one aspect of it. We also have a ritualistic aspect um, in some Maroon societies where people speak in tongues, for example. And these tongues are said to be ancestors speaking through them. And the languages that these people speak when they speak in tongues are African languages that are speaking in the Caribbean, or maybe bastardized African languages. So there is a connection through language that is very interesting and very important to keep to talking about ancestral memory. So that's, that's what I, Thank I'm you. reminded of. When, so. Thank you. Kat, do you still have a question? Hi. Um, I guess my, my, mine is more more of a reference when you were talking about this cotton, silk cotton trees. Yeah. Sorry, it took me a really long time to figure out what it was, but Do I just knew it as a saber. Yeah, saber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Saber, um, and maybe like more in the spirit of like looking at like other histories. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you've come across the Popol Vuh. No. Which is, I mean, in like Western thinking would be considered a book. Yeah. But it's basically a whole. It, it it's now been tr it's been translated into Spanish, mm -hmm. but it's the it just said it's like a whole book saying of like all the Mayan cosmology of the world, mm -hmm. and then it like speaks about how the saber, or the silk cotton tree, mm -hmm. just how it, like it's got different layers and it oh, just yeah, holds yeah, up yeah, the yeah, universe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is written in Mayan. Yeah, it is like one of like the biggest Mayan scriptures, and like obviously now it's got obviously passed through the translation process of being passed into Spanish yeah. um, and it's probably one of like Mexico's um, attempts of like both colonizing yeah. but also legitimizing its own um, indigenous yeah. past and present yeah. but it might be worth I'm sure there's probably now an English version yeah. Yeah. but it's like a, it's huge yeah. like it's a tome but it might be interesting to yeah. research yeah it's also interesting when you talk about these like manuscripts these Mayan manuscripts we talk about in context of decolonization because a lot of the Mayan manuscripts are in the hands of European cities and European museums. Oh, yeah, and they're one. even named after them. They're like the, the Dresden manuscript is one of the most popular ones because in Dresden is housed in Dresden, Germany. Yeah. And that's the cent one of the centers of ancient Mayan knowledge. And then you have this weird reality that we live in where you see these videos of um, white Europeans. They They study the hieroglyphs in the languages in the languages they have the means to decipher it they decoded it and they have the artifacts in their museums and then they go back and they like set up like institutes or um, organizations to help reteach the local indigenous population I know but and, and it's this, this notion that the Mayan culture is dead but yeah. it's very alive yeah and like it's if anything is bifurcated and become quite syncretic with whatever has come through from outside, but like the Mayans are still there and like they're still like, it's <coughs> like very, very um, heterogeneous. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is true. But I think like this book is quite particular that um, it is th like through the Mayans. Um, 
and then separately I just found like it was quite interesting you're talking about the whirlwind figure yeah, yeah, the whirlwind. I think like in Mayan cosmology you also have this trickster that lives in the Seba yeah um, yeah so I, d I don't remember the name but yeah yeah sorry all super connected and super interesting and I think it's um, important to kind of define what these things are for ourselves and not look um, look through texts that are generated through a certain paradigm when it comes to researching this or like thinking what is what is my culture where do you look for it looking at a book might not be the right place so, yeah. thank you for, for that thank you uh, to everyone for all, for those questions i think we could just keep talking and talking um, so please, like, if you want to hang around and have an informal chat, do that. But um, please um, join me in giving uh, Lissandro a round of applause.